Toby. Idea, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, well, on Dead Man's Shoes, the, the basic story of, of this kind of was a brother comes back to avenge a crime that's you know, been inflicted on his own brother. And in the original script, the um, his brother was older than him, and he was the same age as, as this gang of lads, but he was the one that they always picked on. You know, there's always one at the bottom of the ladder that gets preyed upon. And the guy who was meant to play the part two days before, because he's meant to be slightly handicapped, and two days before he, we started shooting, he, he just backed out and disappeared. He just left a message on the answer phone and said, I can't do it, and I couldn't get older, and he just vanished. He'd obviously had really bad, uh, you know, cold feet on it. And I remembered I'd met Toby at an audition for, for this film, but he was too young for that part, because in my head, you had this thing in your head, he's got to be, you know, the same age as <coughs> him. And I thought, well, I've got, I'm two days away from shooting, I need to cast somebody. So I rang Toby up, and he was at a little workshop in Nottingham where they're kind of going, kids from some of the rougher areas of Nottingham, they go onto this drama course, and it's like a little outlet for them. And I remember meeting him and thinking he was really talented, but I couldn't quite fit him into the film. And so I just thought, well, you know, he's the only person I've met that I think's got something. So we, we changed the part two days before to make him this guy's younger brother. You know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it, but you know, it was the problem wasn't so much that you'd making the leap of faith in that. It was the fact that to play someone with the kind of almost like a mental disability, and to you know, Dustin Hoffman took him about eight months to do Rain Man, and this kid had got about two days to pull it off, and mm. and he turned up at the the cottages where we were staying up in Matlock. And he came as that, and I knew him. And he was—he had all—he'd got all lines in his eyebrows when I met him. He was quite a hard-looking guy. And uh, and he turned up, and his hair had grown out a bit anyway for some play he was doing. And he was Anthony, and I was just like, and he'd done it in, on the train on the way over, just worked it out on the train, and it was just like unbelievable. So, mm. um, you know, it, and that place in Nottingham, I've been to again and again, time and time again. I got both the lads for Romeo Brass. From yeah, there, boys. yeah, you, huh? they they take kids yeah. from about five or six up to twenty one, yeah. and um, and the, and it's all based on improvisation in there. So some of them go into TV and stuff, but you tend to find that because of the way I work with heavy improvisation, it's the best place for me to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm curious, sorry, the, the girl in Midlands was she from there? Yeah. Because well? I thought she was. What you were saying about big stars and stars who are hungry, I think that her story is probably the most interesting one. Yeah. That runs. That runs definitely it. she's the best thing in it she's great and reese evans was a diamond as well he really tried his hardest you know what i mean he was one of them that really dug in and um it's uh you know in reflection you know she, she was a real find and uh, she's a really talented really talented actress and she's working a lot now so and that, all the lads from 24 7 were from there as well so i think i think that's 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 one of the things i've picked up it's quite often a story centering around kind of young people growing up it's, it's very much even at the centre is almost the most interesting story yeah. often, often in, in the films that you've, you've made so far. Um, you, you mentioned Scorsese as a director you really admire, and you've yeah. actually, unlike some British directors, you've actually made something your, yourself out of your influence in yeah. Scorsese. And I don't think many of you will know much about Mike Lee, but it's interesting you don't like his work. I, it's not, I think I, the I can try to get worth, the films, but they are caricatures rather than. He doesn't seem to respect the, you know, the authenticity of the experience, almost inviting people to laugh. laugh yeah. At. But what, what other directors have you actually drawn influence from, as well as life and experience, which you say is very important? But yeah, I mean, Alan Clark um, oh. is a big, a big influence on me. Who, who, there was a big period in the 80s when I was growing up and. I remember, I don't know if anybody, has anybody seen Made in Britain? Have you heard of Scum? No, I yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so he, he, he made Scum, and he made these really incredibly hard-hitting dramas, but at the time in the 80s, it was a, like Mike Lee and all these guys were having to make films for television, so I'd like, I remember switching uh, Channel 4 on, and it had only been on a couple of years, I think, and Made in Britain came on, and I was a skinhead myself, and I was in a gang, and and I'd had a couple of tattoos and, you know, I'm sort of sat and this guy comes on that I'm looking at and thinking, you know, he, the sense of anger in that character and it just like, literally stayed with, inside the mind of the character and this anger and, you know, you could see his world falling apart around this guy and it was just so on the nose and so brutal and when you watched that and you were living in that kind of environment yourself, I was just staggered that, you know, Channel 4 coming out was a big thing for this country, you know, it was a massive thing because up to there it was just, I don't know, it was, 
there had been kitchen sink dramas in the 60s, but it just seemed that all the filmmakers had to go into TV, and so, uh, you know, in your toxic to where I'm from, you, I never would have gone to the cinema. If they'd made them for the, for the cinema, I probably never would have seen the films. And so there was, a, there was like Alan Clark at the time, uh, Gillies McKinnon um, had directed, I think he did a thing called... Um, Sure, it was Gillies who did the Grass Arena. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Like which was, was a yeah, yeah, just yeah, and so you, you, it was brilliant for me because all of these people that should have been making feature films, sorry, all the people that were making feature films should have been out there making yeah. films had been pushed into TV because there just wasn't the finances. So for someone like me growing up at 12 or 13, I got this really broad education. And it, so I was watching British cinema, although it was meant to be a TV film, I was seeing the, the best British the best cinema. Film. Weeks after it was finished, you know, because they were, it was just made for Channel Four. Um, so there was that kind of whole period of Channel Four movies, um, and I mean, and then I, the directors that I kind of like outside of that tend to be individual films of other people, you know. Scorsese and Alan Clark, my work probably, st yeah. if you were going to like pick yeah. a place where it's <coughs> it probably sit between the two of them, yeah. because it has the musical influences of editing the way that, you know, the style of editing to music, the way that Scorsese uses sound, but right? that hard-edged reality of working class life that's in Alan Clark's but Working with actors, because he did as well. Yeah, and, yeah, and, he, and, he, yeah, and he kind of, um, that thing of not pulling punches, you know, violence never looks as real as it, the sequence in Scum where he finally just thinks, oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to go straight, I'm just, and he gets two pool balls in a sock, and just walks through and dusts about five people. I was watching that as a kid and just like, that looks like something I've seen down the pub, you know, it was, whereas normally it's the old quick one in the stomach, a bit of an uppercut, you know, the, the fights that go on forever fights, and I was watching knockouts in these things where someone had throw one punch and someone actually went down from it, and, you know, and that's what, that's what I was seeing on the street, and somebody had actually was putting it onto the TV, and so it was kind of to realise that somebody out there thought that my life was interesting, not my life, but, you know, that community was interesting, um, you know, was was a big influence. They really shot scum, didn't they? This film, and it wasn't half. half the T the TV one was there was a TV, yeah. and then they did a film version. Didn't they? they did two versions it's because they've, they've just bought out. But hand mad, they bought a box set out in America that isn't coming out here. Uh, have Alan Clark, and they've got both versions of scum on it. Um, but there's some tough stuff in it. But it's just one of them films that you know it's. People of my age group, it's like a legendary cult classic, you know. Any questions from anybody? Yeah, How do you feel the British film industry has um, has started to progress after um, the collapse of Film Four in America? Um, it's um, <coughs> it's funny because there, there was a period when I made Twenty Four Seven where it, it was there was, was, was money anywhere, you know, you could literally walk in with an idea and. Um, I think a lot of shit got made, and there was a massive backlash, you know, because all the lottery money come out, and there was a lot of places to go, and a lot of people making films, and I think a lot of the wrong people got the money, and so before, just leading up to Dead Man's Shoes, it was proving really difficult to get anything made, because everyone had kind of gone, you know, what are you doing with our money, you know, the public were, there'd been a few high profile flops, and people were going, you put eight million quid into an absolute lump of crap, and you know, the scripts weren't even there. It was like, you know, they were just rushing things through. And on the back of Lockstock, there just seemed to be this run of 150 gangster films. And it just seemed everyone was kind of jumping on the wagon. And it isn't until the money dries up that the people who are actually the genuine filmmakers actually, although there's not many of them at the end of it, you're actually left with the, the talented people, I think. And so, for my mind at the moment, there's probably only four or five people in this country that are making independent work, because a lot of people are trying to make a new Billy Elliot, or they're trying to make a new rom-com, you know, or a Hugh Grant movie. There's two types of British cinema. There's the one that America thinks we make, and then there's the stuff that changes things, you know, and, uh, <coughs> and there's not many people doing that because it's not fashionable. And so, you know, if you want to go and get a film made, it's probably a lot harder than it was when I first kicked in, but um, it, it, that's a good thing because it means you have to work that hard and you have to prove that what you've got's worth making.